What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. And joined today by Dan Meski, somebody who I've been lucky enough to really get to know the last few years, and he is so involved in the volleyball world and a great story. So Dan, thanks for uh, having a cup of coffee with me this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Let's just talk, tell us a little bit about your volleyball journey in the coaching ranks and working your way up here. I knew you as uh, just the coach at Augustana University here in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and now you're uh, doing big things at the D1 level. So just tell us about your journey a little bit. Yeah, so I graduated uh, college in 2007, and that was when the housing crisis happened. So I wanted to be a firefighter and build houses and do residential construction. That all got shut down. So I had an opportunity to stay in school with volleyball at Nebraska. That was an old club coach of mine, was connected with John, and John Cook gave me an opportunity to be a manager there. If you look at their bench now, they've got like a million dudes on the back of the bench. I was one of those dudes for four years. So I did, I was a manager and went to grad school there, and then I was a volunteer coach when that was a thing. Now there's full-time positions, but I was there for four years making nothing and then was lucky enough to get hired on full-time when both assistants left at the same time and I was still there. And I did that for three, four years. And then once I got married and started having kids, wanted to change and kind of lifestyle. So went the division two route to Augustana. And that's where we probably first came across each other was up in South Dakota there and absolutely loved it. In my time at Nebraska, I was able to work with Danny, our current head coach here at Louisville. And She stayed there and then ended up getting the Louisville job. And when she got that job, she came to South Dakota. They were recruiting a kid from South Dakota at the time. So she came up, stayed with me and my wife at our place, just catching back up. And she was like, yeah, I'm I'm here on a recruiting trip. Yes, but there's another motive here. I'm getting the job at Louisville and I want you to come. And I was like, in no way. We love it here. There's no chance we're coming. She's like, well, let me talk to Laurel, my my wife. And then like five minutes later, Laurel was like, this sounds pretty good. I think we should do this. So that's part of the reason we've probably been good here is Danny's such a good recruiter. So then we came to Louisville and Louisville in 2017 was coming off of a season where they were RPI close to 200. The year prior, they had won the ACC. So lots of ups and downs in the program. And uh, we had a couple great players enter the program that have stabilized us a bit. And then we rode the wave to where it's taken us and we've had a great time doing it. So Todd Chamberlain, our other assistant coach, hopped on with us a year after. And we've had a really fun crew that's been together a long time. Todd Chamberlain is actually having a second kid in a week, but like our families have grown as the program has grown. There's been so many new kids in the last few years. There's a lot more humans running around the program. It's just been really fun. I love it. It's basically my dream job right now. What I'm doing. It's just, it's been a blast. And I was lucky enough to get to spend a few days with you guys this fall. And I noticed that, that it literally did. It almost felt more like a high school program where coaches running, you know what I mean? I, it just, it had a really laid back feel for as big time, top five, top 10, top five program in the country. It had that family feel. And I know people talk about that, want to say that I totally thought I was hanging out with a bunch of high school coaches, just having a great time. That's a huge compliment. Danny gives me a weird compliment like that sometimes too. She's like, you would have been a great gym teacher. And I'm like that. Okay. Cause it's like, you know, and you said, it's like, oh, it's like a high school program. That's actually a compliment though. Is like the way that we can interact with each other and all of that. I think some college programs would be like, whoa, 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 it's college. And it's such a you know big deal what we're doing here. But we, I think we are able to, like you said, 
accomplish some big things and go for some big things, but then stay really grounded. Danny says a lot to our team at the beginning or the end of a practice, probably once every two weeks of just, can you guys believe this is what we get to do? Like you guys are here at school to play this sport and keep the ball off the ground. And like, I get paid to show up and coach it. Like when you step back, it's, this is pretty cool. What we get to do day to day. No, and I mean that as a very sincere compliment because my uh, volleyball IQ isn't the highest. So when I hang out with people, I literally tell people, I meet coaches, it's okay. They were nice to me. I know it sounds weird, but some are right. And I'm like, Hey, that's a place I could send my kid because I know they're getting treated the right way. And not that's all there is to winning volleyball, but I think you guys are definitely killing the culture game. I'm going to move on. Let's talk about your family life. And you brought up your amazing wife, Laurel, who I got to meet. And I'm guessing she might be the boss in the family just by my short time with her. But talk about it because I get to follow you on Facebook and you are, you're that average dad having, hanging out with the fellows in the garage in the off season, going to your kids' games. Talk about balancing that with your coaching. You have to have the right staff. So that was a big thing when I got here with Danny um, was just, and I told her, like when I was at Augustana, now that was division two and my wife was working full-time club and division two is a different, it's a different time commitment. We started a week later in our season. We ended a week earlier. Right now, the division two, they're heading to their elite eight right now. So the season was shorter. The commitments were shorter. I was going to be teaching in the, the winter. Like it was just very different. So when I took the job at Louisville, I told Danny, I was like, listen, I'm like never in the office right now. I've got a at the time, I had a two-year-old at home. I had another one on the way. And I was like, I'm cool with coming here. But like in this phase of my life, I'm not going to be in very much. And she was like, no, I know you're going to get your stuff done and whatever. We were fine with that. And then I was not in the office very much those first couple of years when I had opportunities to grow with my family and just be there. My wife, we're fortunate enough. She's been staying home with our kids for most of them growing up. She now is signed on. She's actually working with LOVB. So she's getting back in the working world. But we were really fortunate to do that. And I wanted to be around for a lot of that. Come five, six years later now, all my kids are in school and Danny and Todd, our other coaches are starting to have younger kids and they're starting to have those kind of commitment challenges. And it's nice to have that be a full circle moment where it's like, I'm kind of in the office, maybe a little bit more sometimes and they're not. And it's like, it ebbs and flows and it works its way out. But if you don't have a staff that you trust and you know that they're getting what needs to be done. So when game day shows up, you're getting the same thing from your coaches from a preparation standpoint, from just a, a vibe standpoint, all of that. It's hard to accomplish that. And so we've known each other so long on staff that it's just so hard to get that. You can't fake that. You can't get that in a year. Danny and I have known each other. I've known Danny longer than I've known my wife. I've known Danny, geez, going on 16 years now. So it just takes time to get to that point where you can really have pure trust with somebody. So I feel really fortunate that I know I'll look back on these years and never be like, oh man, I, I can't believe I missed that. Sure, sure, there's tons of things that I've had to miss because we've had games and there's certain things you obviously can't get out of, but I feel like I've been around for a lot and I really value that. Yeah. And I'm a little aside. I'm thinking that's you. I remember texting a couple of years ago and I'm like, you must live in a cool neighborhood. It was you and the fellows in the garage and the kids running back and forth. And I'm like, Here's this guy, I just saw him in the final four coaching on the sidelines. And I guess you are a real human being, Dan. We were doing that last night. All my neighbors were over. We were in the garage. I've got two old TVs in there. But that's the cool thing about my neighborhood, too, is we had volleyball on one of the TVs. Louisville football was playing the ACC championship. Georgia was playing Alabama. And here are some guys who didn't know anything about volleyball until we moved here a few years ago. And they're watching, you know, we were watching USC pit because if USC was to you know win that, then the regional would come here. There were big implications. So we were all going nuts, but a good time. But yeah, it's, it's cool. It's community. It's like a community feel and it's definitely like a big family. Absolutely. Oh, let's talk about your podcast a little bit, crushing it. You out of rotation, which you talked about, Hey, it's a time commitment during the season, but you're killing it. I, I watched all those episodes, um, early on, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing and are you going to pick that back up now when the season ends? Yeah. So I think we're on hiatus right now through season. I, I had wanted to keep it up during season, but I figured out the rhythms of my week of prepping for teams and then player development on our program. And I was like, I'm just stretched too thin to do this because it really truly is a hobby. I think I've always loved listening to podcasts. I thought there was maybe just a gap in podcasts for just volleyball. You get football or you get fantasy football and there's a hundred of them and you can find the voice that you like or the whatever and find your niche. With volleyball, there just weren't that many. There were some great ones, but there was just a handful that are out there. So I just thought, what can I commit to? And in the off season, I was going about once a week 
And then I thought in season, maybe I'll try once every couple of weeks. And I just, like I said, I just realized in season, the rhythms of that wouldn't work because I was doing everything. I was doing the editing, figuring all of it out. It's, I called it my midlife crisis where I was just like, everybody finds like a new hobby or something to do. And I just decided to do a podcast. I also, surprisingly or not, like I've always felt, and part of this is working with Danny. She's such a good connector. She's her number one thing is just connection and just vibing with people. And being around Danny, I've always noticed I don't do that at the level she does. And it's something I can work on and in recruiting. It's so important. So I thought maybe the podcast was an opportunity. Here's some people maybe I haven't ever connected with, but here's a great medium for us to connect. And then not only am I going to learn from them, but we can put that out for everybody. I do have a backlog of probably, I don't know, eight episodes or so that I got done before season started that I'm excited to release with some really interesting people. And then John Klanick, who I've signed on as a co-host to help me carry the load. We're going to be doing some stuff down at the final four, which I'm excited yeah. about. So I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll announce some of that stuff soon. And I don't know, it keeps it fun in, in the off season hobby. Like I said, midlife crisis. Yeah. And I'm definitely not editing mine. Um, I got approached about doing this. I, I said, I see what good podcasts look like. I can't do that. So I can talk. Well, that's why I had to give it up because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist with it. And I was like, I'm spending way too much time editing. There's no way I can do this in season. So I'll probably have to, but I don't make any money on mine or anything like that. There's no sponsors, no nothing. So I'm like, how much do I really want to go in the hole to do this? If I'm going to pay somebody to edit it. So I got to figure that out this next off season. That's been VB adrenaline for the last seven years. Not either, but I tell people it's my golf game. Now volleyball is. I gave up the golf membership, the equipment, and now I just spend that money on volleyball, but it's been really cool. And so it's my hobby that become full time. So I want to talk about what I've learned the most from crush on Instagram as well. With just your, I don't know, your tutorial reels. How did that start? What was that? And I love those things. <laughs> Thank you. I, it's interesting. There's been a lot of just random people come up that'll say, hey, those are great or appreciate you putting that out or whatever. And that again was just, I felt like our social media with Louisville Volleyball, like our Instagram, for example, for just Louisville Volleyball was really starting to blow up as we were getting better. But that's managed. There's so many people that are managing that. So you've got your social media team. Our assistant coach, Todd Chamberlain, has access to it. But there's everything's got to be on brand. It's not just an Instagram handle of just, hey, go nuts with whatever you want to do. So as we were growing, sometimes content would slow down. And recruiting back in the day used to be talking to club coaches constantly and sending letters and sending emails. And that there's less of that. And there's a lot more of kind of what we're trying to do with social media of just exposing what your program is and teaching and showing how you go about teaching the game and what you value and what things look like day to day. That's probably more important with recruiting than the actual you know, an email. Like when's the last time a kid like read an email? Like they really, they're, they're texting or they're Snapchatting or doing whatever. So that was a thought that we had within our program of just, let's just get content out as much as we could. Because with mine, we wouldn't post on Louisville VB, but anything on the story, we could always put on there. So you can just pop a story on there. So we're like, all right, well, if I post it, we get a story every single day on Louisville VB, and then that would stay active and that'll stay on people's timeline. So it was really just to expose our program and just to show people what we're about and then hopefully grow the game. And we've gotten a ton of feedback from my Instagram in particular. I've got a lot of feedback of People that have appreciated even just really basic volleyball things. It's not always just, hey, here's the division one highest level this is what we're doing. It's more of, hey, if you're all of a sudden thrown into coaching a 12s team, like what's important? What keywords should I use? How should I communicate? So I'm really passionate about that. And just coaching overall, I think too, like when threads became a thing, I thought, okay, I can put out, you know, some written content of just thoughts that I have about coaching and maybe some stuff that would help. So I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, it's another hobby, but it's also... I think it also delves into the world of recruiting a little bit and just exposing your program. It certainly feels like it's not just an aside of something I'm doing. It's there, there's a, a method to the madness, I think. Let's move into that with, with recruiting a little bit, just and more so the changes that you've seen the last couple of years in the game, in the sport, everybody talks about, right? Volleyball's blowing up, but what do you really see, especially when it comes to positive changes in the game that you've definitely noticed? I think there's tons of them. I don't even know where to start with. The number one is the way that we switched the timeline recruiting wise. And it's not perfect yet, but when I first got into college volleyball, the rules were very vague and then the loopholes were enormous. So for example, when I first got in, you couldn't do official visits until like normal, like right now, like junior year, but anybody was recruitable and anybody could do unofficial visits at any time. 
I would assume before I even started, it was like, oh, they can take an official, their junior, senior year, whatever it is, and sign. Let's get to them their sophomore year. So then you can send an email to a club coach and say, hey, we're interested in Sally Joe, and we'd love for her to come on an unofficial visit. We can't call her. We can't do anything. But if she calls me, I can talk to her. I can do whatever I want. So it'd be great if she could. Here's my number. And then, boom, that sophomore would contact the coach. Once she calls you, you can talk about whatever you want, recruiting, set up an unofficial visit. Great. Then I'm trying to compete with you, and I'm like, oh, you're doing a sophomore year. I'm going to go freshman year. And so now I'm going to contact all the best freshmen through their club coach. And so then it was freshman, and then it was like, well, we're going to go eighth grade. And then it got to seventh grade. And then it was like people were building their list on sixth graders, and it just kept going. Then finally the NCAA stepped in and really shut down the communication via club coach, which I think was the biggest change just to help recruiting because then like it used to be when does my recruiting start should it start in seventh grade should it start in freshman year oh all my friends are getting recruited it's freshman year but i haven't gotten anything yet it was just it was a mess so i think slowing that down and starting the window more traditionally has helped so much in just the development of those ages because now when you're playing 15s volleyball yeah there's some recruiting involved but they really can just enjoy that year and really grow. I mean, 15 year olds used to be taking college visits constantly and all that. So I think for those younger ages, that's helped a lot. And then I also think from a recruiting standpoint, yeah, with COVID uh, transfers and all that, like the portal's been crazy, but I do think that's going to slow down because now when we're recruiting later, you're finding better fits where when a freshman or an eighth year would make a decision based on what looked cool on a sweatshirt, that might have been the right fit for them from a coaching standpoint, from an academic standpoint. But when a junior or senior is making that decision, they're, they're heading there in a year or two. They're a lot, they're a lot more, they're not more of who they are, but they're closer to who they're going to be in your program. So I think we're finding better fits. And I do think the portal is going to start to slow down because people are finding better fits. I just, I, I think it's only gotten better. I think there's a little bit more we need to fix from the visit standpoint because people are still committing before they actually take a visit. But the NCAA is always a couple years behind on that. And so they'll figure that out and then. As coaches, we'll all compete and then we'll figure out a way to ruin that and then they'll fix it and then we'll ruin it. Like it's just everyone's going to continue to compete and do what they can and then the rules will be a couple years behind. But I do think we're in the best place we've been since I've been in coaching. Yeah, great points. And uh, you know, that's what I live for. So that could be a totally hour long podcast with you and I talking about changes in the timeline and what's good for kids and what gets better. But that is. And that was before my following. What I have heard is it's better now. And I used to scratch my head when somebody would get their setter who was a freshman. I'm like, how do you, how in the heck do you project that? Yeah. High school females do a lot of change in from their freshman to their senior year. And that is uh, volleyball. What do you think about the tournament and just the media coverage and the steps a positive? What is something you would like to see be better just in the promotion of the game, what's something media could do better, um, the NCAA, anything? I think we're on the right track. The NCAA tournament right now, we've got the fifth set. I've always thought like the red zone for football is such a really cool thing to just have on Sunday. And so I think like that fifth set is really cool for the tournament. But I think there's an opportunity to do that like during the year. So take the ACC, for example, let's get together. Let's play every single team plays on a Wednesday or plays on Friday or whatever it is. But then let's get somebody in the studio going back to all the best games. So that way I can just be like, hey, Louisville's playing whoever. I'm not super interested in that game. Maybe there's not big ramifications, but it's the second set and it's 23 all. Whoa, that's pretty interesting. Like we're going to watch that quick or we're going to side screen that with, okay, it's really important this Duke UNC game because if Duke wins, they're in the NCAA tournament. If UNC wins, they punt them from the tournament. And it's okay, I want that game on too. But going on the ESPN Plus app and I got to log out and I got to log back in and I can only have one up or I got to get 18 screens. Um, you got to be a true volleyball fan to be doing that, to really understand it. But if you had a studio production for, a, for whatever conference, I think that would be huge. I think there's an opportunity for that with the PVF and LOVB when they start their pro leagues, try to play those matches at the same time and try to create content where you can show the interest of what's important. So I think we're close though. Like again, since I've been in volleyball, the coverage of it is just, it's phenomenal. It's just, it's so accessible. But it still seems we do have a lot of national coverage, but it still does seem that we're continuing to expose more for already volleyball fans. We got to find ways to bring more into the mix. We got to bring the casual fan in more. And I feel like a lot of what we've been doing recently is like just making it a better experience for already volleyball fans. So that would be where I would spend my time is like, how do we bring new ones into the fold and make this more for everybody as opposed to I'm already a volleyball dork. I already love it. 
And now look, I get so much more, but I still have to seek it out, but I can find it. We got to make it a lot more easier and bring more into the fold that really aren't watching volleyball right now. Yeah. And I've always translated everything of entertainment of it. I remember we do that. We do this word. We have a college internship program, um, doing what little we can to hope, hopefully give volleyball players that want to go into sports broadcasting a little resume builder. And, and part of the reason I wanted to do that years ago was because I turned on a volleyball match and it was a basketball announcer doing a volleyball match, right? And I'd be like, <laughs> why would I ever turn back, tune back into a volleyball match again when that was horrible to listen yeah. to? So my thing is the entertainment value, the human interest stories, right? Like I, we joke, but what we do with the NIT and we literally are trying to make it like a college game day type deal for volleyball. Um, yeah. That to me, there's so many cool stories. Like you want geeks to get up and it's Saturday, right? The Nebraska, Wisconsin matches tonight. Can we do a buildup of that? I don't know. My soapbox there that hopefully we, we get to. And I don't think money is the question as much as it used to be volleyball because no. money is coming in. For sure. So I think you're on the right track too. So it's obviously football is king in, in America here. It's you got to mimic a little bit of what they're doing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. And, and do it on a small scale. I want to ask you, because I know, was it last January you've coached, you've been involved with the NTDP a couple of times. And I know Danny mm -hmm. really is. I, we've been lucky to go there. We're going again in, in December. I love it, but talk about the focus of NTDP, but talk about the instruction, like the best coaches in the country, they're working with those athletes. Yeah, I think it's, when you talk about recruiting, I think that the national team pipeline, the improvement that they've had has been really impressive too, just because 10 years ago, there used to be these huge tryouts and you, know, you didn't really have to try out to get invited to something. And then there were like 18 different camps and they all had different names and nobody really knew what was important, what was exclusive, what was a big deal, what wasn't. And so they've really just simplified that to the NTDP and they've included some college coaches and trying to identify talent. Because at the end of the day, it is about growing the sport in our country and trying to win gold medals for them. So getting the best kids together, getting the best coaches together, and just letting everybody train together, that's something that was it was happening sometimes before, where now it's, that's the number one thing. Is let's get all the best players together. Let's get all the best coaches we can. And let's make sure that we're making sure that the top of our sport in this country is where it needs to be. Because we, we were fortunate enough to do a, a foreign tour this past, this past summer to Brazil. And you look at their national team pipeline and how they function. Everything is about trying to win a gold medal. So it's not a shock that they've won the most gold medals in the world in volleyball, but that's in every club, every 16 year old, every 14 year old, everything is building towards being a part of that national team training center. And that is a huge part that changes your life there. Where now like the national team for us is you got to go, that helps you make more money pro. But when you come and you try to figure out how to live in Anaheim and do all that, that's, it's not quite what it is yet. Like it's not, you're not hitting the jackpot when you're on the national team. You are when you go play overseas, but it's not, it's kind of a reverse. So I think we're starting at the right level with that NTDP and, and just how we're building the top of our sports. Yeah, I was there last January and all those kids, and typically there's a third of them or a quarter of them at a qualifier. And then all of a sudden you see them all in one and it's, yeah. it's like almost overwhelming all the talent there. And you probably could see how they interact and compete with, but also against each other because they're all doing the exact same. They're all getting the same instruction. They're all on the exact same court doing the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it is really interesting. You look at the top talent and sometimes you take for granted, like everybody's going to be a great competitor. Everybody's going to be a great teammate or everybody's going to be whatever it is. And kids are so different. And at that level, it really starts to separate when you want to start to build a list who you think is great and who you think needs to develop and who you think, oh, they might not make it. When you put them all together with all the best, it really separates that out. So I think it's a great opportunity for the coaches and the people that are trying to build that national team, but it's also an opportunity for those kids to see, okay, I'm a big fish in a small pond back home, but now when I get here, I've got a lot of work to do on this and whatever else. It's a great opportunity. I remember Bergen, Bergen Riley, we followed her career and she got invited to this NTDP thing a few years back and everybody in South Dakota's what the heck's that? And she went and when she came back, it was her sophomore year, I was able to interview her. And I'm like, what's this thing like? And she said, I'll never forget this. She said, I loved it. 
because I was not the best person in the gym. And that motivates me because when I go back, I want to be the next person, the best person in that gym, which I think separates her from a lot of people. But I'm like, yeah, the best, the best, I think want to be there to continue to, I think they really see where their game's at, don't they? And they can walk away being like, whoa. Yeah, I got it. I agree. And it's just different when you play them on a club team and there's one or two great players on a club team and you're playing against the club team that's got one or two great players. And then there's holes to exploit and all that versus the entire team is phenomenal with that at, at, a, at a situation like that. I think it just separates the top. So yeah, it's a cool opportunity. I want to, I want to leave you on this coaching staffs. As I learn, you are, you probably, what do you get? 10,000 steps in a match on the sideline. <laughs> Talk about that. Is that, is that the head coach's preference? Is it that's still, as I watch staffs and the assistant basketball, it's normally always the head coach. Talk about that with volleyball and how is that decided? And man, you move around a lot. <laughs> yeah. So every staff shapes what they do different, but I know for us, you know, I do our defense, which some of the conversations in match would probably be surprising to people because I, Sometimes I'm not totally in tune with what we're doing because I'm only really watching the other team and trying to stay one step ahead of what they may or may not be thinking about doing and then communicating that to our front row and our back row. But then when we're siding out, a lot of times I may be talking to the middle who's about to go in or I'm talking to the other assistant coach who brings down. And so I'll look over to the staff and be like, is so-and-so passing? Like, I have no idea. I haven't even watched her pass a ball because I'm not really watching that. I'm really only watching the other team. So for us, we've just decided that, and I think in volleyball, you'll see probably more head coaches that sit or that are less active because a lot of times the team will look to the head coach first. They almost always will. And so if the head coach is really high strung or really upset or whatever, they're going to mimic that behavior. So I think Danny does a really good job for us of just being pretty even keeled, being next point mentality, what's important right now, not dwelling on the past. So she sets a really good tone of how we want to function. As an assistant coach, I'm a little bit more, I'm able to be a little bit more emotional and go with the swings of the game when things are stressful and things are important. Like we, I can feel that and I can express that when things are exciting and we're crushing it, I can express that as well. And I can go on those swings with the team just because I think that they mimic more so what the head coach is doing. So for us, we've just decided that having one person that's up and that's closer to the team. And there's sometimes Danny from the bench is yelling something that maybe they can't hear. And then I'm just echoing what Danny's saying. And so it just streamlines what we want to do and it makes it consistent and simple for our players. And we've really enjoyed it. Todd Chamberlain, he sits for our matches too and calls serving zones. Part of the reason he's, he's serving and passing for us too is a lot more statistics based. So he's right next to the iPad of what we're doing, but that's just what we've decided to do. I think the best rule that the NCAA has passed in a long time is that only the head coach can uh, address the down ref because I didn't really do much before that rule, but there were some assistant coaches that were like constantly talking to the down ref. And then the head coach would come and talk to the down ref and the matches were so slow and boring. And so I love that they got rid of that. So yeah, I'm up and down, but I don't ever talk to the ref. I don't ever ask about what was that call or what was this or so it's only the head coach. And I think that's really helped the flow of our game. And I'll go on the soapbox one more time. The next thing we have to do is we have to put 90 seconds on the clock during a challenge. And if the 90 seconds goes down, then it's inconclusive and we move on. Those challenges need to be quicker too. That's my only aside with the changes we need in the game. Yeah, I did read as we're filming this during the tournament, I did read some comments about another plea to pay to upgrade the technology, the replay technology to get it where other sports have it. And I'm sure the NCAA is just out buying a couple hundred of those today. So, uh, we can do it, but, uh, that there. does, that does slow down. The other thing I do, and I get it just as a general fan, it's so anticlimactic when championship point, you have a review left and, you know, a couple of national championships have ended that way. It's a little, I, I totally get it. I would do the same thing. If I had a challenge as a coach, you almost have to, but it's, do we celebrate? Are we national champions or two minutes later? Yeah. Oh yeah, now we're national champs. But yeah. I, I do like to coach, but just talk about, so you're, because you are up and down the bench, giving the other coaches and student assistants, et cetera, they're giving you input as well, right? I mean, cause you are definitely interacting with them. 
during yeah. the match. Yeah, with everybody. And I, I think a strength of our program is that like everybody has a voice. So yeah, I'm doing the defense, but like when we're getting torn up on something or whatever it might be, the conversation is always, what are you guys seeing? What else can we try? What else can we do? So it's always like what we're trying to do as opposed to like, they need to do this or you need to get them to do this or it, there's never those types of conversations. So yeah, it's very inclusive and interactive. And I do think like our staff in particular, like our full-time staff um, have all coached every position at some point. So we do have a pretty good feel for like, again, I don't coach the offense, but even in our last match, I'll talk to Danny and be like, hey, should our middles be running some more Z's, which for us is like a back one. It feels like that's open or whatever. Like we're constantly having those conversations. So we're not too worried about, oh, you better stay in your lane or whatever. Because again, I, again, I think there's a lot of different things you could pinpoint for our program of why we've had success. But one of them is that the driving motivator is to win the next point for every single person. So it's nothing's personal. We still interact in a really respectful way. I think we're really conscious of that. But no matter what's happening, we all understand that we just want to win the next point. That's all we want to do. So that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're interacting. So as long as we all understand that, like it's really, it's a lot quicker to get to what we need to do. So yeah, I really enjoy it, but I'm, I'm excited for the day where I'm sitting on the bench. Honestly, yeah, I'm starting to get tired during matches. Yeah. I get old, you get old in the hurry. I don't know if you could sit still that long. I would like <laughs> to see that, but that's for another conversation. I appreciate so much of your time. And I know you have a little bit busy rest of the day and week, and we're going to wrap this up and coach, thank you. Thanks for uh, giving us an insight into your program. You as a person, your family, and I always appreciate your time and how generous you guys are with it. So good luck the rest of the way. We will be seeing you soon. And for everybody else, that's uh, coach Dan Besky, assistant coach at Louisville. And that's going to wrap up another edition of the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Again, check us out on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and on X at VB Adrenaline. Go in, like us, give us a comment, give us your feedback as I venture our way through this fun, exciting new ordeal for us. But that's going to do it for our time and we will see you soon. This is Darren Tipton signing out. Thanks.